I'd like to welcome Sister Cynthia to Expand Your Horizons. Sister Cynthia has been um, at the helm of Expand Your Horizons for years now and has been providing public programming, uh, not only for the Notre Dame sisters, but for the local community who wants to hear these incredible conversations that happen amongst uh, experts on different topics. So please, Sister Cynthia, I'd like to turn it over to you to welcome our guests and explain the evening. Thank you, Molly, and thank you for helping us all get organized. Um, my name is Sister Cynthia, and I am a Notre Dame sister. The Notre Dame sisters have always believed in education as a tool for change. And in 2012, in November, we had our first Expand Your Horizons, and that was the year I moved here to Notre Dame Housing. So I kind of got talked into being a part of this, and then now I'm a little bit more responsible and learning many things. Um, as I considered our topic, I realized what today is. It's Columbus Day, and I have a slide showing how I just took a quick review of the history. That Columbus Day, the origins of this holiday are a little frightening to me. When I was here at Notre Dame Academy for high school back in the 60s, that's a long time ago, Sister Eleanor was always dealing with the current events, and so she tried to keep us up on it. But I kind of look back at this history and I just cannot understand how or where I was living. And then I remember I was an adolescent. So throughout high school, uh, we were challenged. John F. Kennedy was shot. Things start happening, civil rights. Um, Governor Wallace came to town and we went marching. Then I was joining the convent and the same kind of things were going on. I even went to St. Benedict's and taught religion classes, totally ignorant of the realities of the people and the children in my class. So as I started to get familiar with the history, um, I just really reviewed all of this when I started teaching GED about six years ago. So we know Columbus came and he came to a new world, but that was for Europeans. There were already many people here. So as you might see on the slide, if it's, yeah, there it is. The um, Europeans are the ones who started this whole colonization, Florida and Virginia on our eastern part of the United States now. But I learned as I was teaching the GED that there was colonization in Africa, Australia, and it seemed like everywhere. In September, when we did our Palestinian um, presentation, why they matter, is because the Palestinians themselves were removed from their land for another people to have it and now they're wanting to come home. So they are indigenous people also. That was kind of a new thought for me. South Africa, we heard the word apartheid and that's being applied in many places nowadays. And as a white person who's learning all of this, it's a big challenge. So the actual holiday didn't get its name until um, it was went over time, but I wanted to point out on my slides here in purple, it should be 1801 to 1850s. There was a mindset that was there that still exists. And it's that doctrine of discovery, the manifest destiny. And I don't know if I was taught that, but when I started learning about doctrine of discovery, I was a little horrified. And then I realized that our Supreme Court in 1823 made a decision to affirm colonial powers. Meanwhile, this past couple of years, I've been doing a lot of watching and listening to see what's What's happening to the people of color, specifically the black students that I was teaching? Where did they come from? What was their experience in life? And then many other things started happening. On my outline, I'm also pointing out that in 1830, it was the Re Indian Removal Act of Congress. And again, I thought of the Palestinians being removed from their homeland for someone else to live there. 1968 would put it in the years when I was in high school and college. And that's when October 12th actually became Columbus Day officially. But those of us who lived in those 1960s, we know that was also the civil rights movement. So there was an energy moving forward. And then the next part of the slide is going into 1989. There's a transition going on and it's the indigenous peoples who are beginning to get a voice and be given a voice by a few. And in South Dakota, back in 1989, they declared 1990 the year of reconciliation between Native Americans and the white. I don't know where I was in 1990 as far as awareness, but Martin Luther King's day, a birthday, and that Native American day were coming together. They're coming to the front. 
and each state is going to have to decide what they're going to celebrate. And um, in 2016, Lincoln actually said they're going to celebrate it here in Nebraska. So that was the first Indigenous People Day. And the, um, the state of Maine, there's a governor who I found an article and she was quoted as saying, there is power in a name and in whom we choose to honor. And I think about the statues going down and I think about what we have been listening to in the news. And the last part of this slide is saying that in 2020, our unicameral decided, well, here in Nebraska, we're going to celebrate both days. So in 2021, we're going to see both days being brought forward. So that's the end of my use of the slides. So in preparation for this event, I recalled the history and the original title given to us by um, uh, Pastor Cynthia was um, Ramifications of White Silence. And I kind of returned to that to say, there's a lot of ramming of ideas into our white heads that come out of the discovery and the manifest destiny ideas. And during this European colonization, a whole white dominance developed and pretty soon things started happening that formed and shaped as I call myself here. Um, I had a white formation and didn't know it as I grew up on a farm in, in central Nebraska. Our guests this evening are going to help us look at this question of what is behind and inside of this white silence. And I'd like to mention Dr. Um, Cynthia, we have the same name, so we, she's Cynthia L and I'm Cynthia H. But as I was beginning to look into this, I came across white silence and it was sacred activism episode 17 and there were 10 seconds that I kept returning to so I hope someday you can go look at, at episode 17 and there was a question in there why can we not talk about this history I have a family that it's very difficult to talk about this history so our guests um, are Dr. Cynthia Lindenmeyer and she will be taking the lead in a few moments but I also want to introduce um, Deborah Mabry Strong She's um, going to come up on the video in a moment, I think. And Ajmal uh, Biden. These are two people who have, in my books, I would say respect, awe, and gratitude. Because these two educators have been restructuring me from my white formation and transitioning me into a deeper awareness of the many issues that are going on in our country in these days. So if Deborah is available, she's going to be introducing our main speaker. And I would just like to co comment on um, your questions will be very necessary for us to have an honest conversation with our three guests this evening. So Deborah was going to be next. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Cynthia. Good evening. I am Deborah Mabry Strong, a retired teacher, educator, and consultant. We need and we invite your comments and your questions this evening. Please enter them and we will share them with our speakers for comment and or clarification. At approximately 7.30 p.m., we will take time to address your questions. Now it is my honor to introduce my former pastor, I, I cut off my friend oh, and my. colleague, Reverend Dr. Cynthia Lindenmeyer, founded the Virtual Sacred Activism Community and currently serves as a chaplain for American Public University System and the American Military University. A graduate of the United States Military Academy, Cynthia commanded a signal company in Korea, then earned her Master of Divinity from Duke Divinity School and Doctor of Ministry from Princeton, the, from Princeton Theological Seminary. Cynthia was a consultant on the documentary Invisible War, co-producer for the Black Votes Matter virtual tour documentary, and is now in the editing phase of the documentary, Exploring White Privilege, How Do You Sleep at Night? 
Her passions include ministry through teaching, spinning, Zumba, and yoga. She and her husband, Colonel, retired, Ben Slendenmeyer, have two children, Carly and Luke. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Cynthia Lindenmeyer. Uh, thanks, Deborah. And um, yeah, Molly, if you can get the first slide up, that would be wonderful. So tonight's discussion, we are going to be talking about white silence. And I will go through some definitions. And these are not academic definitions. They're just my definitions that I have formulated based on my, I'll, I'll say three year journey that I've gone on and really educating myself about systems of white supremacy, white pr privilege, white fragility, and just uh, this whole construct that surrounds us that really as white folks, we don't even know it's there until we begin uncovering it. So uh, next slide, please. I do want to just take a moment because as Sister Cynthia acknowledged, today is uh, Indigenous Peoples Day and I just want to take a sacred pause. So if you could just bow your head with me or close your eyes. We acknowledge that the land that we are on belong to the Omaha tribe, the Ponca tribe, and it was taken from them. So as we honor today, I hope we never forget the many uh, injustices that have occurred so you and I can be where we are today. And that is why we're gonna be talking about white silence because there, uh, there needs to be an awakening and a realization for us to, to know how we got here and why we see just systems of inequity all around us. So next slide please. You might have heard this quote before, there comes a time when silence is betrayal, uh, spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. April 4th, 1967. If you remember, he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. But it came during a speech um, that probably put a target on his back. And that speech was a time to break the silence. And he spoke very much not only against uh, racial inequity, but also against the military industrial complex. In that speech, he talked about what was happening in Vietnam. And so that is where that quote comes from. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. So the next slide, these are again, these aren't um, textbook definitions, but they're ones that I'll be, when I, throw out the word white silence or white fragility or white supremacy. This is what I'm talking about. And white silence, maybe you've experienced that. You're in a room with a, a diverse group of people and racial issues uh, begin coming up. And you just, you don't know what to say. And you think probably the best thing is, I best just not say anything because at some point we probably had an aunt or uncle or grandmother or mother or father say, you know, sometimes it's best just not to say anything at all than to say something stupid. But really when it comes to issues of racial inequality, that is not the good protocol to follow. You've got to say something. And white silence happens a lot of the times because we just, we get uh, that deer in the headlights freeze motion. And maybe we feel a little bit guilty or angry, which that kind of leads into white fragility. We start feeling these these emotions of maybe shame, and uh, that leads to white fragility, which leads to white silence. And it's all because we live in a system of white supremacy. And if you look at my definitions here, if you just think about any truth that you think is a truth, how much is it based on a narrative 
that has been uh, told to you by the winners of history or, um, or the oppressors of history. And uh, I'll be talking more about books later on, but a great book called The Lies My Teacher Told Me helped me begin this journey because I realized living at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is where the Army War College was, um, when stationed there, I was taught that the military did this wonderful uh, outreach to children of Native Americans and, and helped teach them English and all this. And then when I went to Pine Ridge Reservation, I learned a completely different narrative. No, the children from the uh, Lakota people were taken and assimilated and forced this narrative. And so there's always another side to history. And that's what is so important to understand white supremacy, this other narrative. And you've got to get through white fragility to see this awful truth so that when the time comes, you will be vocal. Uh, next slide, please. I do, just so we can have a template to uh, apply these. Um, I don't know how many of y'all watched the, the debate last week, but this was a question when Susan Page asked the time, um, the vice president, this question, the case of Breonna Taylor was justice done? And you have two minutes uninterrupted and oh, I can see that it didn't show up. But I wanted to highlight, if, if you've ever been taught how to do an apology, like if anyone ever tries to apologize, but their next line is, but it's, it just negates the apology, right? If you look, Pence says, well, our heart breaks for the loss of any innocent American lives and the family of Breonna Taylor has our sympathies, but, and what you can't see there is, I trust our justice system. So he's saying, I trust our justice system, which if, if you're a person of color in this country, you don't trust the justice system. Look how many uh, injustices have happened in the name of the Justice Center. You can think of um, so many names that have been killed by police officers. There's Freddie Gray, we have Philanda Castile, of course, um, Rashad Brooks, George Floyd, and mentioned here, Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, so many names, so many lives destroyed by those who are police officers. He goes on to say, a grand jury that, um, but I trust our justice, a grand jury that reviews the evidence. And it's remarkable that as a former prosecutor, you would assume that in a panel grand jury looking at the evidence got it all wrong. And then here's that word again, but you're entitled to your opinion, Senator. Now, if I had a white male tell me that even as a white woman, but you're entitled to your opinion, Senator, I'm not gonna take that well. And so I can't, I can't imagine how Senator Harris took that uh, comment. And then he goes on with regard to George Floyd, there's no excuse to what happened, justice will be served. And there's that word again, but, and, and then he uses these terms rioting and looting. And we hear this often in politics, the rioting and looting as if there's these, it's, it's the savage response to injustice. And we won't go into uh, the details of all that, but it's important to listen to words. And so he's saying rioting and looting. He goes, I, it's astonished, I must say this, this presumption that you hear consistently that America is systematically racist. And he's saying that it's a presumption, but what if it is a fact that we are systematically racist? All right, so we'll go on to the next slide. And here's another example. This one probably hits a little bit closer to home. Um, maybe many of you heard a couple weeks ago about the Nebraska Democratic Party. They issued a resolution and it says the resolutions that the Democrats were denouncing and that word that's supposed to be highlighted, it says the actions of elected Democratic Don Klein. It doesn't attack him saying he is a white supremacist. He just says that the actions in a way that perpetuated and the words there say white supremacy and sparked deep division in Omaha. So it says that the actions of elected Democrat Don Klein that perpetuated white supremacy. And so these actions did perpetuate uh, white supremacy because that has been how our justice system has really been built upon ever since reconstruction post-Civil War. 
And then in response, um, it says our state central committee passed a resolution dealing with and what's there is systematic racism. So systematic racism is again there. And it's these two um, words and constructs being thrown against each other. But what happened was the Nebraska Democratic Party, they could have easily just ignored everything and that would have perpetuated white silence. But they chose to speak up and speak out. And if you've been in Omaha, you've seen the fallout that that has uh, created. So next slide, um, as a pastor, uh, I get asked a lot about churches. And uh, Malcolm X, who born right here in Omaha, he said the most segregated hour in American life is high noon on Sunday. And in the church, I remember in many churches I've served, uh, I always have members of the congregation saying, you know, Cynthia, you're so passionate about racial justice, so where are all the black people? And I say, no, that is not, that's not the goal, because that is what we would call an assimilationist uh, perspective. And if you look down in the third bullet there, I love Dr. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, because he has uh, excellent definitions. And he says an assimilation this expresses a racist idea that a racial group is culturally or behaviorally inferior and is supporting cultural behavioral enrichment programs to develop that racial, racial group. Like what I talked about, what happened with our American government taking children of our Native Americans and trying to assimilate them into so-called European white culture. In 1967, over 50 years ago, this film, A Time for Burning, was filmed Augustana Lutheran when a church tried to just create relationships with North Omaha. And the results, um, the, it tore the church apart, the pastor had to leave. And if you watch that movie, we haven't really changed whatsoever because what you hear the people in North Omaha say is it's not up to them to teach white people how to, uh, how to understand what's happened to black people. And I hear that even today, and as white people, we have got to learn. We have got to, to uh, educate ourselves. And it takes work. And you're not gonna, you're not gonna learn by asking a black person out to lunch in an hour. It takes, I think, years of reading, studying, analyzing, and really looking at oneself in the mirror and saying, where have I shown some ignorance in understanding what has happened? And if you're a church person, Sadly, the church is very much implicated in this narrative of white supremacy, not just in our culture, but in our theology as well. All you have to do is go to your church and look and see how many pictures of white Jesus there are. I mean, I honestly don't think Jesus had white skin and blue eyes. And oftentimes I've heard in Sunday school groups, the story of Cain and Abel, if you remember the first murder in the Bible, well, the mark of Cain was that he had dark skin. And that is actually taught in white Sunday schools. And it just perpetuates this racial hierarchy in theology that has also hurt uh, women very much so. And I know in the Catholic Church, you, you've battled that as well. Um, the last bullet here is black churches see white people, or white people are trying to be saviors when they go into a black church. So let's say, a black church needs help with a food pantry and the white church comes over and tries to overrun it. That's white people trying to be white saviors. And so the reaction of white guilt sometimes tries to be that white savior. And um, you'll, you'll hear that often as well. So go ahead, Molly, thank you. Next slide. I know we're covering a lot here. Education is so important and there's a slew of books out there. I even noticed at Half Price Bookstore, they have a whole uh, section on really understanding racism. But these are some books that I've read that I have found very helpful. Um, Cast by Isabel, uh, Isabel Wilkerson. I haven't read it yet. I just got it. But Ajamar and I are going to be doing a book discussion um, November 30th on that. I'll have more information at the end. And um, But she has done an outstanding job at looking at the caste system in India and then applying it to this racial hierarchy that we have here in the United States. Lies my teacher told me, 
Um, many states are thinking that this is Columbus Day. You read this book and you don't want to have anything to do with Columbus or, uh, or many of our presidents. Woodrow Wilson uh, totally shattered my idea of Woodrow Wilson, a very important book to read. The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander um, highlights what happened in our prison system, really going back to uh, post-war, Civil War, but especially when um, in the 80s, Ronald Reagan declared the war on drugs and our prison system really uh, 20-fold and mainly uh, people of color being arrested for petty crimes on drugs and just filling up our uh, prisons and incarceration rates went up. And slavery by another name um, during Reconstruction, uh, people of color were gathered, even though they were emancipated, maybe they were just walking the wrong way home and they would get arrested and then, then they would be pretty much uh, indentured servants. And then on the other side, uh, sociological history, I mentioned uh, Dr. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. I think this is a very important book to read. It's, it's very dense. It helps to be reading it in a, in a group um, because it's, it's pretty impactful, but a, a wonderful book. Uh, White Privilege by Robin DiAngelo. I think it has to be on that must read as a, a white person. And um, it's, it's not that hard of a, a read. And then she has another one, um, What Does It Mean to Be White? Again, another powerful book that, that kind of unpeels the layers of these definitions. And then I think it is important to understand the civil rights movement from a Northern point of view and Southern point of view. And the Northern point of view is best told through the eyes of Malcolm X and from a Southern point of view through the eyes of Dr. Martin Luther King. And so the sword and the shield does that very well. So go ahead, Molly, yes, next slide. If you're not a reader and you're like, I don't have time to do all this reading. Um, if you're a podcast person, I loved White Lies on NPR. It talks about um, what happened in Selma and the murder of James Cleve Pastor. And uh, it's kind of like this mystery that goes on and it's um, very gripping. The 1619 Project by the New York Times talks about the first slave ships that came to the United States and the repercussions and how, can you imagine uh, farmers, black farmers now are losing their land because people told them that they're not good farmers. And you look back at history, well, who do you think farmed all our land the last 200 years? But it's a, it's a very powerful um, podcast. And seeing white, another must. If, if, if you're starting from ground zero, I would say start with seeing white podcast. Netflix, I Am Not Your Negro, based on James Baldwin's work, excellent overview of the civil rights movement from a very um, brilliant mind, but given at a, a very uh, easy to understand level. When they see us, um, if you remember in the, the, the late 80s, the Central Park Five, I, I was at West Point an hour north of New York City, and I remember this. And I remember when a whole page of the New York Times said these men are guilty and it was paid by Donald Trump. Um, but I didn't realize what happened and why these five men were targeted. And this documentary shows how the police um, pretty much forged the evidence to convict them and a very moving um, story. American Son, um, one act play, beautifully done. And Hello Privilege, it's me, Chelsea. That's a documentary, as is 13th. So American Sun is probably the only non-documentary there. And then on Amazon, Get Out, uh, uh, that's not a documentary. Powerful movie to, to begin to understand what it's like to be a black person among white people. Selma, it's a historical out of Omaha, about two twins who are trying to get out of Omaha and just keep getting uh, caught in systemic racism and very powerful because it's based on, on Omaha here. And then white savior racism in the American church from a theological perspective, this will talk a little bit about what I um, alluded to earlier. So next slide, I know this is a lot to take in. Um, 
Sister Cynthia had asked me to talk just briefly about sacred activism community, and it's based on um, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Harvey and some work he's been doing over 30 years from a uh, Buddhist perspective, but really all, all philosophical and religious paradigms. And he just asked, whatever it is that breaks your heart, that's, that's your passion. That's what you get involved in. And then you form supportive networks with other people for that cause. If it's racial justice, you, you get together and you practice remembrance. So like today, we honor um, what the sacrifice, sacri sacrifices that brought us to Indigenous Peoples Day and then embrace fierce feminism because I think what we saw in um, Senator Harris is that there is a lot from women that has just been totally ignored. And for the sisters here, what would the Catholic Church look like today if, if women had been allowed to also be part of the priesthood? So it's, it's looking at the importance of not only the male side that we all have in us, but the feminine mystique as well. And then by doing this, returning to joy, as a, a racial justice activist, returning to joy would be to see HR 40, the reparations bill, actually be moved upon and for reconciliation to happen here in Omaha. So we don't have this um, system of inequity that just continues on and on and on. We're, we um, have the, in 1891, George Smith or George Coe was lynched here in Omaha. Uh, and so thinking about how much that uh, has affected this city. I mean, we've never had an African-American mayor. We've never had an African-American uh, congressional representative or senatorial representative. And, and that makes a difference. And that's why as white people, we have to speak out and we have to advocate for these changes. All right, so I think that should be about the last slide. The next slide just has my contact information. Um, that's my email there, Cynthia at sacredactivismtoday.org. And um, like I said, if you mark your calendars, we will be having a race and reconciliation service that will be broadcast on Facebook Live October, the evening of October 25th. And then uh, Ajma and I will be doing a community book read on CAST on November 30th. At uh, I believe it's 7 p.m. and that that information will all be on the sisters um, Notre Dame sisters website. We'll get that to them. So I know I'm over my time. Oh dear. Okay, I will turn it over to Sister Cynthia, who is on mute. Ajmal has a few words of wisdom for us. That's what I was getting ready to do. <laughs> My own now. One of the things that I like to share is that in the past few years, I've done a number of community forums with uh, Pastor Cynthia uh, at her church and elsewhere. And one of the things this event, hopefully, we can do is get us more involved in these conversations. Uh, three points I'd like to make. One, it is very important to have conversations and dialogue on racial issues in this apartheid city that we live. We've been somewhat segregated for many years and people act as if they don't know how to address it or talk about it. So we need to do a better job. The second thing I think is we have to make sure our institutions, both education and secondary, elementary and post-secondary are having a sense of proportionality and how they engage on racial issues. You don't send lightweights and third string quarterbacks to talk about some of the mundane issues when we have some of these major problems. So we need to bring the very communities and people have been most affected into many of these ivory towers. And again, we have to look in terms of proportionality and issues. And then I think the most important thing is we must have matrix. We must be able to measure how effective are we. So whatever we do, we should be able to say, has there been progress? And it needs to be progress measured, not from feel good and talk about, but actually progress where you see more uh, a narrowing of those wide gaps. And part of it deals with wealth as well as deals with our conditions that we are today. The year 2040, we should have a society where there would not be majority white. We would be what we call a society where there would be no majority per se. 
those are things we need to be talking about and preparing for as we move forward. So as we do more of these events in our community and within different circles, we envision and we invite you to do more of this to talk about these important issues of our day. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the first questions that we received is what is the difference between white silence and burnout? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, to me, I mean, going back to my definitions, white silence is that uncomfortable feeling that leads to guilt, shame pretty much based on ignorance. And I always say, trust your gut. If, if you see or hear something and you're afraid to say something, boom, you've just activated white silence. And what was the other um, burnout. phrase? White burnout? Burnout. <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, I'm very aware of burnout, but then I'm reminded, um, I have white skin 24 seven. So yes, I have that choice to just say, oh, I think I'll just be a white person now. And uh, to me, burnout is just a, a psychological cop out to say, you know what, I'm not gonna get engaged. So sacred activism though, really embraces the idea of the sacred. So if as a white person, you're feeling like you're getting burned out, that's why the practices of prayer and meditation and silence are so important. So you don't reach compassion fatigue or you don't uh, reach burnout. Because I, I guarantee you, if, if you're rooted in those spiritual practices, you're not gonna burn out. And do I practice my spiritual practices? No. So do I get a little bit tired? Actually. No, because I realize how important it is right now, especially living here in Sarpy County um, with Trump flags all around me, how important it is. So almost every time I see a Trump flag, whatever burnout I have goes out the window and maybe that's my military training, but we <laughs> all have in us an ability to go and dig deep. But I think spiritual burnout is very much a, a real thing. And that's why rejuvenating oneself, connecting with the divine, waking up every morning and, and not getting stuck in this little perspective that it's easy to, but really understanding that you are a divine spark and that um, there's just so much more than, than the politics going on around us. And, um, and not having fear, I would say, burnout can come from fear, but when you don't fear anything, you're not going to have burnout. And what is there to fear? And I don't mean to get all biblical on you, but I mean, if you fear death, then you got to get over that because death is just another transition to a new phase of spiritual growth. And ask yourself what you fear. And once you get over that, I don't think you're going to, to, to reach burnouts per se. Is there, um, I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Pastor Cynthia. Uh, Jamal, I'm sorry, could I just ask a quick question? You just made a kind of an interesting reference to that question the other day when we were talking. Do you have any kind of perspective on, um, you know, uh, white people kind of fighting the good fight and then using the term burning out to, to kind of walk away? Well, what I was alluding to, and I, I may disagree a bit in some areas, but as an African-American, you don't get a chance to burn out in the United States in a racist society. And it's like years ago, Father Merwall told me that he don't get to take his collar off when we were talking some politics at advocacy. And again, he at the time was on supervisor, and I, under my breath, I said, I don't get to take my skin off. We can't afford burnout when our whole existence, our society, and our children who are not yet born depend upon us of making it better for them. Burnout is something that happens. I know when you're overworked and you're fatigued and so on. Again, I've met many white folks who will get in the struggle for a few months or a few years and then you won't see them again because they resort back. And I remember years ago, I remember a Methodist minister who told me tomorrow after this table talk, I will go back to be a white male. It was somewhat arrogant in the way he said it, 
but it was a reality. And so at the end of the day, the poor and the people who are the oppressed, the meek, those who've been disinherited, we have to continue to fight of the fight forever. And again, as Senator Chambers once says, when Father Time catches me, I want to be in motion. And that's what's unfortunate in our community. The other half wins the game because some of the folks who were supposedly on the front line, they've decided to disappear. But again, at the end of the day, we have to continue to move beyond uh, the visions and the sense of people who are myopic. And again, burnout is a, is a kind of a strange term when you talk about social justice, equality, uh, and spirituality. Thank you, Atama. How realistic is it to expect, demand, anticipate white churches to go to black churches seeking reconciliation for racism that caused the divide? I would argue a little different. I would use the, the term that well, one of our friends says about reparations and, and again, redressing the 450 years of oppression and the vast disparity. So it's one thing to go for an apology. It's about setting up policies and system that deals with white privilege. Again, we cannot be equal when your pocket is full of, of, of funds that you are acquired because of generations of transfers of wealth. So it's one thing to deal with from an abstract or a very uh, apologetic manner. It's another thing we enact policies and systems so that when you get opportunities that are unearned, we call white privilege, that would be again the, the main thing. But I really think we have to talk of reparations in HR 40, but also how we have to make sure these institutions that are public funded uh, provide a sense of parity in our own communities with Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, other groups have been historically oppressed. Yeah, and, and to add to that, Deborah, I think um, a white church would have to do the necessary work to understand white privilege and really deconstruct the narratives that have taught them about um, the disciples all being white, Jesus being white. And uh, I remember the, the church that I belong to in New York um, during my ordination process had a balcony and I just thought it was a balcony where the choir, uh, it was built for the choir. And when I learned that it was originally built for the slaves, uh, that really hit hard because um, it, it reveals that uh, I, I, African Americans could go to a church, listen to white people talk about God being loving and then be subjected to the, the pain and the torture. And, um, you know, I think it's time for, for white people to really die to the ego and, and go into black church. I can tell you anytime I have gone to a black church, I have been so welcome. And in the military, I loved as a, a chaplain leading the gospel service. And I would just say to every white person, Go to a black church and you're, you're going to be welcome. And I know that's difficult now during COVID, but start going online and watching um, African-American services. Very true. Thank you, Pastor. The next um, submission is a comment slash question. Assimilation, assimilationism of American Indians was not limited to the U.S. government. Boarding schools played a major role in this torture. Would you agree with that comment? Yeah, there was a, um, Ashma, I don't know if you remember the date, but we had a uh, table talk on Native Americans and it was held over at um, the older location, previous location for Big Mamas. And a woman at my table talked about how she was brought up in a boarding school and then adopted here in Omaha and didn't even realize that she was taken from a Native American uh, from the reservation. And that was, that was powerful. But yeah, that's a very good example of assimilation. And I think it does go back to fear. When we fear another culture, we just want to assimilate them. And I would even use the term brainwashing because you have some Native Americans, African Americans, other folks who've been so, their brains have been washed so much that they have no clue of who they're 
historical ancestors and families and members are. And we even see that sometimes in some of these adoption programs where they will raise these kids in such a way that when they leave the home, they have no clue about how to deal with the reality because our society is very racialized. So yes, it's a form of psychological torture, but it's more than anything is brainwashing. And again, when you take kids away, even what's happening on the borders in the United States today is again, it's a manifestation that we have not learned from our history. True. The following question was heard at a webinar and it was asked by Bishop Timothy Clark. How will the church debunk, deconstruct and reconstruct this faith, the faith in this culture? Oh, that's, that's an easy answer. You just got to get rid of the status quo and um, put those who have been debunked uh, in the teaching role. So I would say, uh, you know, the Catholic Church, when sadly all the priests were being looked at, what they did was they turned the attention on nuns that they would have called radical. But you, the, the people that are controlling the narrative have got to step out of the way and allow those who have been doing the work to be doing the teaching and the speaking. And we need a lot more diversity in our, our churches, and especially so at the leadership roles. And I think it is interesting right now, the Catholic Church has Pope Francis, who, who really debunked all the traditional uh, aspects of what it means to be a Pope, taking on the name of St. Francis. And here in Omaha, my friends that are Catholic, um, I, I, this is probably the first Pope I just adore, love, mm -hmm read and yet my catholic friends don't want to talk about the pope and um i think that it says a lot and i'd say if you're catholic just follow what this pope is doing and, and this pope um i think is a wonderful start to be debunking that for catholics for those that are christian i would say study jesus study the sermon on the mount and ask yourself does my church do what Jesus asked for in the scriptures? And if the answer is no, then it's time for a change. And it's time to have people in those leadership positions that are doing what Jesus said to do, not what institutionalized religion said to do, but, but really what Jesus said to do from a Christian um, construct. And uh, I think it's important, again, like I said, it goes back to that intuition, to that inner knowing I believe that is a very important, especially during this time of the pandemic, it's important to be grounded and to have those spiritual practices and to listen to that intuition. I think that's a very God-given sacred part of your being. Thank you. We have about eight minutes left, but there have been a couple of questions that are asking about local state legislation that we can support. For example, the Nebraska Constitution still includes the term slavery. Right. I, I believe I, I, um, I voted a couple weeks ago, or maybe that was just, yeah, I think it was like two weeks ago, and that is on the ballot. Um, so you can vote to remove that, um, that wording out, which it seems a name that we're having to even do that now, but yeah, I guess that's a start. It's a baby step. And I would say support HR 40. Again, read about that. And that's been introduced in the house for many years and it's really never made out of committee. But basically let's say is let's talk about our history, the slavery and Jim Crowism. And again, how do we have the dialogue and reconsideration of all these agendas we have not talked about in many of these post-secondary educated institutions. Um, so we really need to start to do a better job of making much more institutionalized of the history and deal with things that we've not dealt with. And again, all we have to do is borrow from what they've done in South Africa to deal with their apartheid. And they can give us a lot of directions here in the United States. Those are both very potent and important um, points for people to consider with their ballots this year. What is being promoted locally in the schools to break into white silence, public and or private? 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that one to Ajma because he's, I know he's done a lot working with Omaha Public Schools, but I'll just say the curriculum has got to change. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to have grown up here in Omaha and never knew anything about Malcolm X. Malcolm X, it's, it's a shame that his legacy is not taught here in Omaha. And this is the first year that um, the understanding of Will Brown, who was lynched downtown Omaha, um, September 26th or 28th, I believe 1919, that his, what happened to him is being taught. So uh, Ajamal? Well, I would say our schools is dismal when it comes to teaching culture and history from the perspective of people who've been victimized. So even the post-secondary institution, UNO, Creighton and so on, there's not enough people indigenous of this community who are teaching their histories and particularly the natural historians who've been part of it. One example was years ago, they brought in some ragtime group, Minnesota Humanities Council to teach about the busing case. I'm sitting in the audience and someone's reading newspaper articles about it, even though my mother's one of those seven women who brought the school district for their apartheid racism and sued them and won the case. So I really think that the result of what we see today, because we have not been teaching adequate history and so on, and even this conversation we're having today, it should be front and center at the universities uh, in this city. And we gotta do a much better job because part of the oppression that we have is how people have been brainwashed should become educated the fools of a sense. And we gotta change as many of these paradigms so that we can again see the meek inherit the earth. If anyone else has additional questions, please enter those so that we can forward them to the speakers. Yeah, and I think if, if you're in a room, um, there was a study done that, that uh, some African-American students talked about what it was like to be in a classroom with white students who didn't say anything. I would say as, um, a well-meaning white person, I think it's better to say something and say, I just, I wanna say this and and say it, um, what, what you're thinking, because it shows if you're authentic, uh, you're going out there and it starts a discussion. And I think a discussion is much better than silence and um, Ajmal, how would, I mean, if, if you're in a room and it's um, a very, it's, so this topic is race and white people don't say anything, I mean, you pretty much just write them off, right? I would challenge them. And other issues, I go back to what Martin Luther King said is the silence of our friends. I cannot begin to tell you the number of friends who were white or different complexion who did say anything or said anything about social justice or we had to kick up to the curb. But at the end of the day, people will respect you for at least learning and going on a journey. Uh, there's no thing as a dumb question when you're in a certain journey. But again, you got to at least do some basic homework. Don't expect people to educate you on how to tie your shoe. And again, what I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, if we have no smoke fumes, if we have no examples of doing anything, then we become like that oxymoron do-nothingers. And that is what our community is composed of, comprised of if we, again, allow the people who are not yet born to see a society that we were born in and we didn't do much ourselves. So I really think we all have skin in the game to use that expression to transform this community and make it a city on the hill. Yeah, and Molly, if you could just put those two slides up about the follow-up events. And what Ajma and I always talk about is you just can't talk, you got to do. And uh, just when you have that feeling of being uncomfortable, that's good. Then do something about it. Don't just sit there being it's uncomfortable. It's eight o'clock. And uh, so on, Molly, if you could put the slides up on November 30th, we have the uh, discussion on cast. And please read the book before you come to the discussion. <laughs> and then on October 25th, it's gonna be um, live stream from Claire United Methodist or Claire Memorial. Um, we're just having a race and reconciliation service. We had one last year. This will be the second one. And uh, this is part of the HR 40 initiative that Ajamal was talking about that's going on here in Omaha. And then the other slide just talks about 
the CAST Community Book Read if you want to go to that one. And if you go to the, um, the Notre Dame Sisters site, they will have that information on how you can sign up. I'm going to get that to them. Um, if I might share about another upcoming event on November 7th, and this is being sponsored by the Poverty Education and Advocacy Team from First United Methodist Church and Clare Memorial Methodist Church. This is their seventh annual forum, and this year the focus is on a conversation about the intersection of racism and poverty in our community. That will be Saturday, November 7th from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. I'm sorry, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. via Zoom. And you register for that on eventbrite.com. Hey, this is Sister Cynthia again, and I would simply say, uh, our time is up and more slides are coming forward, inviting you to participate. Um, so thank you very much to Ajmal, Pastor Cynthia and my friend Deborah. And um, we have decided ahead of time that Pastor Cynthia will give some final thoughts on how sacred activism and our honoring of a meditation and self care, I guess. So thank you everyone. Um, Oh, I would want to add that Notre Dame Sisters have a website. You can go there and look up our ministry. And in that category, you will see our social justice work of the safe homes, trafficking, and immigration work. So please uh, check out our, um, our website. Pastor Cynthia? Yes, the Sacred Activism on Facebook. If you just search Sacred Activism uh, Public, Sacred Activism Community Public, that will come up and love to have you join us. We try to do weekly episodes that focus on a topic and we have focused on um, r racism we've focused on uh, right now we're focusing on nature and we'll be focusing on politics and so it's taking any issue that maybe breaks your heart and exploring that a little bit more and then providing ways to connect with others to help you uh, to to learn, to grow, to keep you accountable with that. And um, so I just want to say thank you to the sisters, to all. And this is an ongoing dialogue. So please be in touch with Ajmal and I. And you know when to speak out. It's just a matter of listening to that inner voice and, and doing it. And that's how I would end is be in touch with your inner self and listen and pause and, and don't be afraid to have, um, to speak out and speak up. <laughs>